My last name is Lee, Bruce Lee. I was born in San Francisco in 1940. I'm 24 right now. In the beginning, I had no intention uh, or, or whatsoever that what I, what I was practicing and what I'm still practicing now would lead to this. <laughs> <laughs> My father was born in 1940, in the year of the dragon and in the hour of the dragon. So he was a dragon through and through. 1940, November 27th, Sagittarius. <laughs> Most people think of Bruce Lee as um, being from Hong Kong, but actually he's American. His mother is half German, so he himself is a quarter European. My father was raised in Hong Kong. He was part of a showbiz family. My father was in a Chinese opera for a completely different thing, you know. I rather like, you know, to watch the Lone Ranger, you know. <laughs> My father's very first on-screen appearance is when he was an infant. But he went on to act in over 20 films before the age of 18. He also became the cha-cha champion of Hong Kong. He was the Crown Colonies champion. He had a lot of fire and he was always moving. His nickname was Mo Siting, which means never sit still. My father started training in Wing Chun Kung Fu at the age of 13. So he would be in school during the day, acting at night, studying Wing Chun Kung Fu with his Sifu Ip Man. Kung Fu can be practiced uh, alone or with a partner. Uh, practicing alone, they involve form. Some imitate a crane, a monkey, a praying man. This is a crane form. Start off. He would walk down the street with weights in his hand and punching the air and just always trying to figure out how to do things better, how to be faster. And he got really good really quickly to the dismay of a lot of the senior members in the school. When I first learned martial art, I too have challenged many established instructors. But what I have learned is that challenging means one thing, is that what is your reaction to it? At the time, it was really against tradition to teach Chinese Kung Fu to anybody who was not Chinese. He was actually kicked out of Ip Man's school at one point because they found out that he wasn't 100% Chinese. Both of them, they are so doggone stubborn, you know. Well, 200 years ago, I am taught like this, therefore, if you maintain that type of attitude, you will never grow because, I mean, learning is a constant discovery. He had been getting into a lot of trouble participating in these illegal rooftop matches where different Kung Fu schools would come together and go up against each other to see who was better. So he was competing in these and if he wanted to claim his U.S. citizenship, he had to come back before he turned 19. And so his parents put him on a ship and sent him to the United States. Do you still think of yourself Chinese or do you ever think of yourself as North American? You know what I want to think of myself? As a human being. Under the sky, under the heaven, man, there is but one family. It just so happened, man, that people are different. All type of knowledge ultimately means self-knowledge. Mm -hmm. So therefore, they are coming in to, I mean, for, and ask me to teach them not so much of how to defend themselves or how to do somebody in. Rather, they want to learn to express themselves through some movement, be it anger, be it uh, determination, or whatsoever. <laughs> Thank you.
When my father came to the United States, his training had been in Wing Chun. And then when he started teaching, he called what he taught Jun Fan Kung Fu, because Jun Fan is his given name. So it was like Bruce Lee's Kung Fu. But it was essentially Wing Chun. His first student was Jesse Glover. He was an African-American man. Taki Kimura, who was a Japanese man. He really took on anyone who had a real desire to learn. His school was very revolutionary in that way. My type of martial arts, more and more I believe how to make good use of yourself. In early 1965, he had opened his second school in Oakland. He was part of a community of martial artists who were really interested in playing with tradition and really talking more about what works as opposed to staying within the lines of form. Because of style, people are separated. They are not united together because styles became law. Already he had Jun Fan Gung Fu, so he was going around touting this all the time. And he had an open door policy and was teaching this to anyone. The San Francisco Chinatown community did not appreciate that. They were the old guard and they wanted to shut him down. They issued a challenge to him and they said, we're gonna bring over our champion and we wanna fight you. And if you lose, you have to stop teaching. I was born in Oakland's Chinatown, and I started to study Kung Fu at a very young age, and the master, Jack Man Wong, had this mythical fight with Bruce Lee. So I remember hearing people say, hey, our teacher fought with Bruce Lee. You know, that was really just mind-blowing. I have no fear of opponent in front of me, that I am very self-sufficient, they do not bother me, and that should I fight, I have made up my mind, and that's it, baby. After the fight, even though he had won, he was very disappointed. He was winded and his traditional rigid training had not prepared him for a fight of this nature. Out of that, he decided to do away with his traditional training. Because I do not believe in styles anymore. I mean, I do not believe that there is such thing as like a Chinese way of fighting or the, or the Japanese way of fighting or whatever way of fighting because unless human beings have three arms and four legs, we will have a different form of fighting. And he literally studied boxing, the simplicity of it, fencing for the ability to bridge the gap quickly, but also Newtonian physics. He studied biomechanics and kinesiology. And so he was really revolutionary in just looking at the human body and saying, if I want to optimize this for combat, what do I do? If it is a sport, now now you're talking about something else. You have regulations, you have rules. But when you're talking about fighting as it is, oh, rules. with no rules, no, real fighting. well then, baby, you better train every part of your body. Bruce Lee is a smart fighter. It's not just a good fighter because I think in martial arts, some people train so hard to be strong, but they don't know actually in a fight. It's the mind that needs to be better than the skill. Here it is the natural instinct and here is control. You are to combine the two in harmony. One of his students was Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who was, you know, over seven feet tall. And from working with him and training with him, he gained a huge new perspective in how he would have to change his approach to encounter someone like that and then how to also teach someone whose body is that way. When you want to move, you're moving. And when you move, you are determined to move. Not taking one inch, not anything less than that. If I want to punch, I'm gonna do it, man, and I'm gonna do it, you see? He wanted to bridge the gap between thought and action, to be so in tune with your instincts that you are expressing yourself honestly right now. He really saw himself as an individual guide to his students to say, how do you want to express yourself as a fighter? I can show you what I know, but ultimately, you have to test it and figure out what works best for you. Here I am, you know, as a, as a human being. How can I express myself? totally and completely. Now, that way, you won't create a style because style is a crystallization, you know? I mean, that way, it's a process of continuing growth.
it is easy for me to put on a show and be cocky yeah. and be flooded with a cocky feeling and then yeah. feel like pretty cool and all that. Or I can f make all kinds of phony things, you see what I mean? Blinded by it. Or I can show you some f really fancy movement. But to express oneself honestly, not lying to oneself, and to express myself honestly, you know, that, my friend, is very hard to do. And you have to train. You have to keep your reflexes so that when you want it, it's there. My father liked to go to these different martial arts tournaments. He would not compete, but he would give demonstrations. He would do two-fingered, one-armed push-ups. He would do blindfolded chi sao exercises. Can you break five or six uh, pieces of wood with your hand or your foot? I'll probably break my hand and foot. <laughs> he would do the one-inch punch, which is a technique from Chinese Kung Fu that he really honed and mastered. It was something that really wowed people when he did it. And he was doing this at the 1964 Long Beach Karate Internationals, and he was spotted by Jay Sebring, who was a hairstylist to the stars. And Jay had a client, a producer by the name of William Dozier, who was looking to cast an Asian man for a TV show. Test X2, take two. At this moment in time, my father was not interested in acting. He was really focused on his martial arts. But he went down and did a screen test. There was a finger jab. There was a punch. To potentially be able to do some martial arts on TV was intriguing and exciting to him and also a way to help support his growing family. Uh, I understand you just had a baby boy. Yeah. And uh, you lost him. Sleep over it, have you? Three nights. <laughs> One of my favorite pieces of Fursley footage is actually his screen test. I just remember being struck at how charismatic he is and charming and funny. I found that thrilling because it was real life. From that screen test came the Green Hornet. People had not really seen anything quite like him on television before. However, he came to really not love his performance. I did the Green Hornet television series back in 65. And as I look around, I mean, I saw a lot of human beings. And as I look at myself, I was the only robot there. After the Green Hornet, he was in a handful of guest appearances and he choreographed some films as well. Bruce Lee had a bit part in the Longstreet series, and this had an enormous effect on the audience. What was it? I think the successful ingredient in it was because I was being Bruce Lee. He looked around Hollywood and he saw that there wasn't a lot of Asian representation, and he didn't feel like his culture was being represented accurately or authentically. He was pioneer, not just in the entertainment world, but as a martial artist and as a thought leader. Bruce Lee is one of those icons whose charisma and talent and ferocity as a, as a fighter, as a champion for Asians in arts and media and cinema, his impact is insane. How many times in film is a Chinese required? When it is required, it is always branded as a typical, you know, sang sang sang. He also realized, I can reach a huge audience through this medium. I really am interested in sharing my martial arts and my philosophy and my culture. What better way to do it than through the medium of television and film? The true Oriental should be shown. Hollywood sure as heck hasn't. You better believe it, man. I mean, it's always the pigtail and bouncing around, chop chop, you know, with the eyes slammed and all that. He was still teaching, and he had a host of private students, people like James Coburn and Steve McQueen, and Ted Ashley, who was the head of Warner Brothers. He had a lot of friends in the industry, and it was James Coburn at the time who said, you know, maybe you should go back to Hong Kong and sort of come back in through the back door like Clint Eastwood did with the Spaghetti Westerns. And so he decided to take a trip home to Hong Kong. And it was then that he discovered the Green Hornet was known as the Cato Show. He was seen as hometown guy who made it in Hollywood. And so Raymond Chow was starting a new studio called Golden Harvest. And he said, I'll give you a two-picture deal, and then, well, let's see what happens. I went back 
to Hong Kong 731 and pitched a movie called The Big Ball. And the damn thing just broke the all-time record. <laughs> You came back to Hong Kong, and suddenly, on the strength of one picture, you become a superstar. Everybody knows you. The word superstar really turned me off, and I'll tell you why. Because the word star, man, is an illusion. It's something what the public calls you. You should look upon oneself as an actor, man. I mean, you would be very pleased if somebody say, Hey, man, you are a super actor. It is much better than, you know, superstar. When I start shooting the big balls, the first question was asked, Hey man, how many thousands of feet or films is it gonna be? My reaction is that, first of all, why do I start fighting? The Big Boss was shot in Thailand, and my father was really at the stage of being very passionate about injecting himself creatively into the process. At the time, the martial arts films were fantastical, flying through the air, sword play types of films. Fight scenes are choreographed in the moment, and sometimes they didn't even have scripts. In the movies made here, the dialogue is pretty stilted anyway. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, uh, see, to me, a motion picture is motion. He really wanted the martial arts to have a sort of realism that did not exist in Hong Kong films up to that point. Quality-wise, I mean, I have to admit yeah. that it's not quite up to the standard. However, it is growing and it is getting higher and higher and going to toward that standard what I would term quality. When it came to the martial arts, he was fighting every single day with the director to say, this is how this needs to be. And he was right, because it broke all previous box office records. Once The Big Boss came out and it was so successful for the second film, Bist of Fury, they gave him a little bit more creative control. It was his idea to have it be this cultural tension between the Chinese and the Japanese, because that was something that was very true to the time because of the Japanese occupation of Hong Kong during World War II. And again, that film broke the box office records for Big Boss. It's a very worthwhile death because I walk out and I say, fuck you, man, here I come. Oh, I leap out and leap up in the air. <laughs> they stop the frame. <laughs> I put the in a Sundance kiss. So he did these first two films, they were hugely successful. For his next film, which was Way of the Dragon, he wrote it, he produced it, he starred in it, he choreographed it. He really wanted to focus on the experience of the Chinese in a foreign place. The film takes place in Rome. He was really good at being able to tap into the storytelling for the audiences of the day and what would resonate with them. You could see in his films, his philosophy just, it just effervesces. You know, it just bubbles out of the screen. It's like, fight the oppressor. And I think that's what everyone latches on to. It really shows the closest representation of what my father was like. <laughs> he loved to tell jokes. Welcome. He loved to have fun. And Way of the Dragon is full of those types of things. Watching Bruce Lee on TV was sort of like this transformative moment for me. And I just watched this guy and his confidence and the way he moved and the speed with which he moved. Then the part where he fights Chuck Norris in the Coliseum. And it was just sort of like having discovered a whole new world. And I became obsessed with him after that. Seeing Bruce Lee, it really was empowering. It felt like, wow, this is there's somebody out there that can just do whatever he wants and it, it allowed me as a kid to think why can't I do that these films that he did 
there's a transmission of his energy in them. He worked on himself and cultivated that energy and infused that into everything that he did. The idea that if we do that for ourselves, that we can create impact is a beautiful message. If I were born, let's say, uh, 40 years ago, yeah. if I have a thought in my mind, I said, boy, I'm going to star in a movie or star in a television series in America. Well, that might be a vague dream, but I think right now, maybe... There's a pretty good chance that you'll get a TV series in the States called The Warriors, in which you use, what, the martial arts uh, well, in a Western setting? Uh, that was the original idea. In the late 60s, my father was being considered for a lead role in a TV series about a martial artist. He was passed up because it was believed that a Chinese man could not be a lead. It's a television uh, deal. It's called Kung Fu, and uh, I was supposed to do it. Yeah. But the network decided against it. Bruce Lee had an accent and he was as cool as anything gets, but I think the suits of that time would not have been comfortable with putting a young Asian American lead on the air. Business-wise, it's a risk. And I don't blame them, and I don't blame them. I mean, in the same way it's like in Hong Kong, if a foreigner come and, be, and became a star, if I were the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, mon the man with the money, I probably would have my own worry of whether or not the acceptance would be there. And so he decided to write his own show. Bruce Lee thought it was time in America to have a television show about Kung Fu. So he had this notion of a show set in America where a Chinese man comes to America in search of his sister and ends up that fish out of water story about a Kung Fu prodigy. It was obviously a martial arts vehicle for him to star in and ultimately the warrior is what it was going to be called. Let me ask you however about the problems that you face as a Chinese hero in an American series. Have people come up in the industry and said, well, we don't know how the audience are going to take a non-American? Such question has been raised. In fact, it is, it is, it is being discussed. And that is why the warrior is probably is not going to be on. It was a big disappointment for him. He was sort of struggling to be accepted in Hollywood and to be able to make that mark that he really wanted to make. You look at all the television series, I mean, all of them are gimmicks that shallowly treat. It's all... Money. I had uh, heard the urban myth that Bruce Lee had a, an idea of doing a Western, and that always kind of stuck with me. This treatment and the fact that my father had written this show was always sort of part of the Bruce Lee lore, and people who know a bit about Bruce Lee have heard about this, and Justin was definitely one of those people. And we got together, I showed him the drafts of the treatment and the drawings and all those things. It was amazing to kind of have experience and heard of the myth, but finally had the type papers in my hand. He had pages of character drawings, he had colorful images, he had notes on score. He had a little moment where he took out a pencil, a color pencil, and wrote all over one word, colorful. He like literally changed the word. Just really great. There was so much life in it. He's so prolific. There's the eight pages, but then there's the room full of boxes of writing. And he was relentless in trying to figure things out and developing philosophies. And I knew at that point that if we could build it right, it was to really honor the spirit of what he was trying to do. As a person, one thing that I have definitely learned, and, and my life is a life of self-examination and self-peeling of myself bit by bit, day by day. 
He was very interested in the Chinese experience. So he was looking at a time frame for this show that took place in the late 19th century in San Francisco's Chinatown community. He was very directed and very focused about his intention to show an authentic representation of a Chinese person. At the time when he was writing it, those ideas were so ahead of its time. And I think we wanted to kind of celebrate and embrace that. Things of Chinese will be quite interesting for the next few years. I mean, not that I'm politically, you know, inclining toward anything. You know, no, I understand, understand that. But I just wondering. But I mean, I mean, once the opening of 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 China, you know, I mean, that it will bring more understanding. Yeah. More things that are hey, like different, you know, and maybe in the contrast of comparison, some new thing might grow. So therefore, I mean, it's a very rich period to be in. Though it's like 40 years later, we wanted to make sure the spirit of what he was doing was captured, and that the process also kind of mirrors what he was trying to do. My father died when I was four, so I was very young. But I am so grateful for the fact that he was such an expressive human being. I have all of these writings and interviews and footage and things that really give me a glimpse into who he was as a human being, what his process was, what he thought, what he believed. I'm so thrilled to see this show come to fruition and be able to honor my father and his legacy in this way is more meaningful than there are words to say. I did Long Street for Paramount, and Paramount wants me to be in a television series. On the other hand, Warner Brother wants me to be in another one, but both of them, I think, they want me to be in a modernized type of a thing. Bruce Lee had this idea about a kung fu prodigy. He had notes about that. He had notes about the character Assam, and this really nice encapsulated story about a time period that I really wasn't very familiar with. You want to do the western? Eh? I want because you see, how else can you justify all these punching and kicking and violence yeah. except in the period of the west? We had a treatment. Which, at the end of the day, it's a handful of pages and a lot of notes, but we didn't have a full-fledged series or pilot. We needed to find somebody to help us write this and create this world. Nowadays, I mean, you don't go around on the street kicking people or punching people because if you do, yeah, that's it. I mean, I don't care how good you are, you know. We wanted to tell a different story. I mean, oftentimes when you have, especially the Kung Fu story, I know I've heard the pitch a hundred times. White man goes to Asia and, you know, has to fight the bad guys. What we really loved about this is that this is a young Asian man who comes to America who is kind of on his own identity search. I was finishing up another show at Cinemax called Banshee, and Justin Lin had tracked down Shannon Lee and found out about this notion they had. Uh, from Bruce Lee for a TV show. By then, the guys at Cinemax knew that I was a big martial arts fan and a big Bruce Lee fan, so they introduced Justin and me. When Jonathan sat down with us, it was so clear that though he's a fan of martial arts, he was talking theme, he was talking character, and I felt like that was the best way to start this process. The more I dug into it, the more I became really excited about unearthing what went on during that time period. I knew vaguely that a lot of Chinese had come over for the gold rush, and then a lot of them had come over 
for the work to build the railroad. So I was aware of that whole immigration, but I had no idea what the politics of it were. I didn't know what the Tong Wars were, and I certainly wasn't aware of what life was like in Chinatown at that time. And I guess I could have imagined the racism and the prejudice that existed at that time, but I was just never aware of how sharply it manifested for the Chinese living in America in the late 1800s. This is part of American history that has been totally ignored. This Chinese-American migration, that is so important to, to our country. That chapter had never been really showcased. On another level, I want to be part of a show where we have three-dimensional Asian-American characters. I was sitting in the Perfect Storm offices with Justin and Danielle and Jonathan, and we were talking about the show, and I got this hit, and I just thought, this is gonna be good. The first script, the pilot script, Jonathan really came in and created this whole world that had the Assam story and the immigration experience, but also had these like very sophisticated political machinations, but was really fun and really pulpy, and all these different characters that populated that world so beautifully. For me, it was that day where we all looked at each other and say, Okay, this is it, we're ready to go. This show is the culmination of a lot of the elements for me personally in my career coming together to tell a story that, that is compelling and that has great characters regardless of their background. It really celebrates kind of what Bruce Lee is all about. It's about going out there and having an idea and creating an opportunity for people to come in and seize it. What I'm hoping to do in film is to raise that level and do it. Martial art has a very, very deep meaning as far as my life is concerned because uh, as an actor, as a martial artist, as a human being, all these I have learned from martial art. <laughs> You know, when we first started talking about this show, it was ahead of its time, I think, when Bruce Lee was typing it up and coming up with the idea. But it felt like we kind of brought that to life exactly as it's written. We're not doing it justice because so much time has lapsed and the medium has also evolved. We felt like it was important to build this world. It takes place in 1800 San Francisco. At the same time, it's very contemporary. We really wanted to create three very specific worlds. We wanted the world of Chinatown, which is our primary world. We also wanted the world of the working class Irish to see how they're living and how they're sparring with the Chinese. And then we wanted the aristocrats and the politicians because it was really important to me to convey how the decisions were happening really at the top of the government chain that were affecting the laborers in Chinatown. The San Francisco of our show is a seething cauldron of intolerance and tension. Chinese labor is just flowing in rapidly. A lot of the Irishmen who have been the workers of the area are being pushed out for Chinese laborers who would work for pennies. But what happened was Chinatown kind of grew and became its own world. San Francisco is sort of a microcosm for the United States at this point. It's sort of a, a powder keg moment and a tipping point in racial relations for the Chinese community. As we start to climb towards the legislation in 1882, the Chinese Exclusion Act. Many people have never even heard of the Chinese Exclusion Act. It's a period of history that's been glossed over. And it was a very harsh immigration policy that targeted one race of people. Chinese people could not own property. Property. Chinatowns, a lot of them, became sort of the boundaries within which they were allowed to be. I think back to when I was in high school and, you know, you take history class, U.S. history class, and there's literally, you know, a four-sentence paragraph about the Chinese-American experience. And they helped build our country. And for me personally, I think it was important to be able to tell a story of a character um, that's going through that journey, that American immigrant story we can all relate to. 
We wanted to take this time in history and take the racism and take the immigrant experience, but move it into, you know, a more elaborate and heightened world, a world where we could also have fun and generate a level of pulp and action. My father did that in his films. He had amazing, entertaining action, he had humor, and then you also got to sprinkle in some of the philosophy, some of the seriousness, some of the deeper messages. And this show is exactly the same. It's very Bruce Lee. As long as the script justifies it, but I definitely do not agree to put something in there just for the heck of it because it is an exploitation. When I set out making the show, you know, because Shannon's involved and I knew that the fans of Bruce Lee were going to scrutinize this, I wanted to give them a lot to sort of grab onto. There are moments where I slip in some of his famous phrases into the dialogue. There's other times where certain fight moves we steal right out of Bruce Lee movies and it's, you know, it's all done really to pay respect to the master. It was really, how do we pay homage to Bruce Lee and at the same time create our own show? Bruce Lee had this idea that our warrior, Assam, would form some kind of relationship with a cop named Big Bill. So I definitely wanted to take that name and take that idea that Bruce had and, and build on it. The character of Assam was a character who came from China and came over to America, you know, searching for someone. And then Big Bill was sort of his adversary slash friend who sometimes was described as a drunk, sometimes as just sort of a loud Irishman. But those two characters really stood out on the page. In this world, the psalm is like the draft version of Bruce Lee. We really wanted to get away from the tropes of the 70s and 80s Hong Kong action movies where the martial arts hero is this sort of pure soul on a quest. We took Assam and we wanted to make him really human with flaws and, you know, he's very reckless, he's impulsive, he doesn't always think things through, and he's very much the antithesis of what Bruce Lee would have been. The goal was not to make Assam a clone of Bruce Lee, so what we do instead is we find ways of inserting some of the Bruce Lee philosophy into all of our characters. If you can move with your two from any angle, then you can adapt to whatever the object is in front of you. When people see the show, I think they're going to be surprised. There's a lot of preconceived notions when people hear Bruce Lee, they hear martial arts. Of course, there's, there's great action, but I think they're going to be surprised how emotionally involved they're going to be. And we have the ability to be able to take the audience into different points of view. These are compelling characters, not just Assam, not just Big Bill, but when you watch the show, um, you're going to see that we care about every frame, every second of, of this story. We honored Bruce Lee's legacy and what his real hope for the show was. I hope that the picture I am in would either explain why the violence was done, whether right or wrong or what not. your mind be formless shapeless like water now you put water into a cup it becomes the cup you put water into a bottle it becomes the bottle you put it in a teapot it becomes the teapot now water can flow or it can crash be water my friend <laughs> Casting the main character of Sam, I knew it was going to be a challenge to find someone to play the role, and it was going to be a global search. It was a tall order. You're looking for an actor who is compelling and can handle all the drama and vulnerability, but is also really funny, who can also fight. There was just something so introspective, but also like sort of quietly fierce about Andrew that really just felt right. I never thought I'd be able to play a song because I'd never seen a lead Asian guy on a show before. I'm blessed. I get to do this. Andrew came in. I'm not making any promises. And he blew us away. This is why you want to tell these stories. You want to find people who come in and seize it. And in many ways, that is, to me, kind of embodies what Bruce Lee's all about. <laughs> 
casting the show, we looked all over the world and we found Koji in England, we found Jason in Hong Kong, we found Joe in Indonesia, we found Diane in LA, we found Olivia in Canada, and we have Hoon Lee who played Joe Von Banshee. My goal with this show was to have an interweaving story for 11 or 12 characters, but it felt really important to me to include both the police force and the mayor and the executive branch. Jonathan had quite a huge vision for this show. He wanted to find that kind of balance between, you know, style, pulp, and the period. This show exists in its own universe. We did a few things to just really make sure that there was a signature look and feel to the show so it couldn't be mistaken for a historical docudrama, which is why you see Tang members wearing Armani suits. The wardrobe is really interesting on this show because on one hand, you don't want people looking like they just walked out of 2019, but at the same time, you wanted to have that contemporary feel. In this era, in fashion, it is an absolutely hot thing at the moment for Asian and Western fashion to sort of fuse using period and mixing it with, with some contemporaries, which was really, really exciting. And then the extra challenge for all the characters who fight, they had to be able to move in their clothes. It feels weird to fight in a suit. It looks good. <laughs> They really had to figure out, like, okay, how do these guys look really cool, look true to period, but have a sort of postmodern flair, and not split their pants? The wardrobe is highly fashionable. There's huge trains, there's corsets and jewelry. They've been incredibly open and willing and eager to discuss the aspects of character that would inform costume. Every piece has a story. What colors my ling would wear, what sleeve shapes. It gives you a kind of deportment that we don't have in modern life. You know, they'd walk in a certain way. They'd wear the gloves, the hats, the stick. And then suddenly you see them walking around on the set. That's when it started to feel really real. We knew that we wanted this world to be very tactile. And so that meant that we would have to build. Recreating 1878 San Francisco, you're going to be starting from scratch. And then there was a lot of discussion about scale and the scope of what we were going to be able to create for a back lot. For 24 hours, we just sat talking about we have to build a set that we can reuse. The Chinatown back lot we've built has multiple streets and alleyways which can be redressed and make it feel like an entire city. It's pretty remarkable. We built hills, we have Chinatown streets, we have Irish town. The fact that the set is so comprehensive and so detailed, you don't have to expend any extra energy. You just are in this world. We tried to avoid having green screens and blue screens all over the place. The thing that struck me when I first stepped on the back lot was not only this replica of San Francisco Chinatown, but also the care that Set Deck had taken with even populating food stands with real food and real smells. They make use of a lot of the historic buildings in Cape Town as well. We shot at City Hall. The photographs I've seen of San Francisco 140 years ago are pretty accurate. The opening scene of the pilot, it's a Sam walking off the boat in blackness, and we kind of knew that that shot was key. You see the door open and you see America. And this is an American story, and we are experiencing what it feels like for our hero coming into this world. I like to think that Bruce Lee, if he saw the show, he would be proud. I think we made a very concerted effort to celebrate why he was doing it, what he was trying to do. There's just so much care and love in this work. It's pretty mind-blowing, and I'm, I'm just grateful to be here. It's an action series, but with heart, with a message, style, and substance. You've got fantastic storyline, you've got a great narrative, you've got huge characters. The show itself, it's a melting pot, which is what America really is. The history of this show being an idea that Bruce Lee created, it's such an honor and a privilege. I mean, just don't tell the little kid I was that my name is coming right after Bruce Lee's name on a TV show because I just don't think I ever would have believed that's possible. Bruce Lee, I'm eternally grateful to that man because I'm somehow here right now because of him. To take my father's idea, give it life, give it a voice, adding to his legacy, to be able to correct some Hollywood wrongs, to cast an Asian cast that is so talented, it's an amazing moment. I always learn something, and that is to be always yourself, and to express yourself, to have faith in yourself. Do not go out and look for a successful personality and duplicate it.